Yeah. I hope everybody's had a uh, good lunch and stretched their legs and cleared, cleared their brain. We're going to talk some more about uh, resuscitation now, um, and particularly focusing on, on treatment uh, in the delivery room. I like this quote, I like this woman, this is Virginia Apgar, in spite of uh, saying I, I wasn't a particular fan of the Apgar school, she, she is a great woman, a great pioneer in, uh, in our specialty and I really like what she says about resuscitation, I, I'll, I'll read, uh, read it for you. Resuscitation of infants at birth has been the subject of many articles. Seldom have there been such imaginative ideas, such enthusiasms and dislikes, and such unscientific observations and study about one clinical picture. There are outstanding exceptions to these statements, but the poor quality and lack of precise data of the majority of papers concerned with infant resuscitation are interesting. And she said these words, uh, what, 40, 50 years ago. Things, things have changed a little bit, but. Uh, for something as important as neonatal resuscitation, there is an embarrassing lack of, of evidence uh, to guide us. Now, so, somebody, uh, Jerry, made this point uh, with respect to uh, the brain this morning. But where we've got ourselves into trouble with neonatal intensive care and uh, neonatal brains, but particularly in neonatal resuscitation, is trying to scale down the treatments we've used in adults or older children and try and apply them to babies. And we need, that's my first uh, message, babies are not miniature adults or even just miniature children. If, if I fall over in the middle of this lecture, and I need resuscitation. This, this will probably be because my heart has stopped because of the uh, the uh, stuffing in that chicken we had for lunch today has finally clotted my coronary arteries, and uh, my heart will will have given up. And and if I do that, you can come up and give me chest compressions and uh, cardiovert me, and uh, and then maybe do some ventilation. But if a baby uh, appears to collapse, this is not the problem. Um, Myra Wyckoff, a, a, a very a uh, good American researcher suggests that this sort of heart-stopping um, need for resuscitation happens only about one in every 2,000 deliveries. So in, in my hospital, that's, that's three or four times a year. So most times when babies need resuscitation, it's got nothing to do with their heart-stopping. I think Anton made this point this morning that most babies, in spite of the complexity of the of the process of uh, being born and as making the uh, changes to the physiology of the heart and the lungs, most babies uh, accomplish that very easily by themselves. They don't need any help from us. Um, if babies do require help, it's it's usually not resuscitation, but rather it's gentle assistance with transition. That's what what's required. And what we're trying to do is just help the lungs gently take over the functions that were being uh, undertaken by the placenta in utero. So to reinforce what was said this morning, it's all about ventilation. That's the key to success. The, the pathophysiology of, of uh, a neonatal resuscitation or a baby arriving at the point of needing resuscitation is that the brain stem and uh, myocardial hypoxia cause the baby to stop breathing, become apneic, and then to become bradycardic. And this is a vicious circle. If you're not breathing, the hypoxia worsens, and so you're less likely to breathe. And therefore, what we have to do in the delivery room is establish that functional residual capacity and aerate the lungs. That way we can oxygenate the heart, the heart rate comes up, the cardiac output comes up, and the brainstem recovers and breathing starts. So it's all about, as Anton said this morning, get the fun functional residual capacity established, start to ventilate, and the rest of the body will take care of itself. Five to 10% of newborns require some resuscitation. So having said that 90% of babies do it without us, there are some babies who do need our help. And I would suggest that for most of those uh, five to 10%, resuscitation is not what they need, it's, it's some help with transition. But that translates into a lot of babies around the world. Uh, about a million neonatal deaths per year, uh, 
occur worldwide because of perinatal asphyxia. Therefore, we have a problem that we need to be uh, doing something about. Not only is the consequence death for some babies, but for survivors, uh, there is a large burden of disability, uh, including cerebral palsy, as we heard this morning. So the, what we need to be doing is choosing the babies who need our help, and to do that wisely. So give the babies who are, who are going to make the transition effectively without us, give them room and time to do it. But for those babies who do need our help, then we need to get in, uh, make it safe, make it effective. This is a, 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 a common construct, I think, at least in the junior doctors at our, at our hospital, this is the most common problem, uh, common misconception that, that I think they have. They think of babies who need resuscitation, babies uh, who have asphyxia, and then they think, well, preterm babies are a subset of this overall group of babies uh, who need some resuscitation. And I think this, this is a mistake. And the reason I, I think this is a mistake, uh, it becomes clear in, in the, a survey that we did. This was a, another um, look at the videos that we've, we've taken in our delivery room. And we, we looked at, at little babies. These are babies less than 28 weeks, less than a kilo. So down the small and immature end of the spectrum. And we just saw how many of them cried and breathed at delivery. So of the, of the babies overall, about two thirds of them cry, have an audible cry on, on our video. And about 80%, four out of five babies, less than a kilo, make some sort of respiratory effort by themselves. For the, for the tiny babies, those under 26 weeks and under 750 grams, the numbers are a little bit less, but still more than half of them are crying and two thirds of them are breathing. Okay, so, so Premature babies do not necessarily need resuscitation. I think this is a better way of looking at it. There, yes, there are asphyxiated babies. Yes, there are premature babies. And there are some babies who are preterm who are asphyxiated and do need uh, full-blown resuscitation. But they're the exception rather than the rule. Now... To demonstrate... This, I'm going to show you a video. This was, having shown you a very embarrassing video uh, this morning of our first resuscitation, this is when we'd uh, got our act together a little bit more. This is a, a, a very preterm baby, I think about 20, 26 weeks. But this baby is crying and breathing. And so vigorous that we're having trouble putting the baby into the plastic bag. Still working on our technique for doing that elegantly. This time the, uh, the pulse oximeter is going on in the correct manner. Then being attached. You see, we've got a junior doctor up here passing a cut down endotracheal tube. This is a single, we call this a single nasal prong. Gently trying to introduce it into the nose and not as they do in Germany into the brain. We, we, we found that to be the ba a bad, bad way of resuscitating babies. We put it in the nose. With a little bit of help from the senior doctor, it does go down. And we, you can see we're getting some numbers. Getting a saturation of 40, a heart rate of 77. After all that handling, the baby's perhaps a little bit less vigorous. Doctors need to do something so they've got the, uh, got the suction catheter ready to go, but fortunately the baby has a good cry. The heart rate comes up, 163. Saturation still low. But as I was talking about this morning, it's not the, 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 the number that's important, it's the direction of the number, the trend of the number, so we can see it's slowly going up. How much oxygen the man from the Netherlands asks. This is a very old video, this is 100% oxygen. So 
So just by patience, we've we've done nothing to this baby other than pass a pass a, an endotracheal tube through the nose. So it's about two centimetres inside the nose. And slowly but surely, the, the saturations are coming up. 83. Baby's getting about six or seven centimetres of water CPAP pressure. Now the saturations have crossed 90 and we can all relax because uh, we know this baby's going to be fine. But having said, we have difficulty separating blue from pink. I think this baby is looking very pink and uh, this was 100% oxygen and, and we were probably doing this baby no great favours by using 100% oxygen. We used to think this glowing pink colour was a, was a great reflection on our skills as neonatologists but now we think that that's probably too much oxygen and we've, uh, we've overdone things. The saturation is much too high now but uh, these were the bad old days before we knew about oxygen toxicity. So that's, that's an example of, of what I mean by putting the premature babies, the vigorous preterm baby, in a different category to the baby who needs resuscitation. This baby needs help with stabilisation, help with making the transition, but uh, largely we put the tube in and back off. So things uh, that I wanted to talk about this afternoon include some things that I, I think we understand and we can come up with some sensible guidelines for, like suctioning, uh, like applying a mask, uh, like the use of oxygen. I'm going to put PEEP into this category um, and, and uh, discuss a few more of the things that Anton did this morning. And then I've got a, a category of, of other treatment options and I've put sustained inflations in this promising developments rather than in the things we think we understand category for reasons that I'll, uh, I'll go through. And I'd like to talk some more as I uh, hinted at this morning about respiratory function monitoring. But you should treat everything I say with scepticism. Um, this is, this is a, another quote that I really like. It, it, it says, uh, on the subject of resuscitation, knowledge and experience have now reached a very satisfactory degree of completeness. And you'll see the date up there, February the 25th, 1928. Uh, of course, it was an American who, who was saying these things and they're prone to that sort of statement. But it, it's a reminder to us that uh, Never think we've we've really understand everything uh, about anything in, in medicine, but particularly neonatal resuscitation. So, what I'm telling you this afternoon will be revised, and probably in five years' time, it'll it'll seem completely crazy. But suctioning is something that we we think we we understand at least for the majority of cases. Um, I think we're convinced now that we, in the past, we've overdone suctioning. There's no evidence to support routine suctioning uh, of the mouth and nose of newborn babies. No uh, evidence to support suctioning depressed infants b b born through clear lycor. And for babies born through meconium stained lycor who are active, also no role for suctioning. I'm sorry George has, has left us to go on, on his city tour because he, he's missed a reference. Uh, this was when he was, must have been a young man, 1981. He, he, uh, he said, he found that suctioning interferes with cerebral blood flow and lung compliance. So it took us a long time to get rid of suctioning from um, routine neonatal care, but uh, it, it has ha now happened. The only grey area that remains, I think, is... Uh, to do with depressed infants born through meconium lycor and we're really not, uh, we don't have enough evidence to provide us with guidance there. And I think it probably depends a little bit on people's experience. Certainly uh, people with little endotracheal intubation experience, um, intubating those babies is probably a bad thing to do. You're more likely to cause harm than good. Okay, so... Uh, some practical resuscitation, um, how to place a face mask and my thoughts on titrating oxygen in the delivery room. 
we, when I learned to uh, resuscitate a baby, nobody told me um, what to do with respect to the mask. They said, anybody can use a bag and mask, off you go, uh, resuscitate the babies. But it, it looks like, uh, at least in, in our experience, there are at least three ways to hold a mask. You can hold it by the stem of the mask, between the thumb and the forefinger. You can use a two-point top hold, so the thumb and the forefinger are on the flat part of the top of the mask, or the OK rim hold, where the, the, the th finger and the thumb go around the, uh, around the edge of the mask. So those were uh, three different methods that we, uh, we thought we'd test. What we found when we, we, we looked at people's uh, ability to use a mask was that there was a, a high level of leak around the mask when people were trying to bag and mask a baby. And that didn't matter whether you were a consultant neonatologist, a senior neonatologist, a, a training uh, fellow in neonatology, a registrar, a nurse or a midwife. All of these people had on average uh, around about 60% mask leak. So what they thought was going into the baby, most of it was going out the side of the mask. And that's a problem with mask technique. The other problem with uh, mask leak was that the people who were doing the uh, resuscitations, and this was on mannequins, were unable to judge how they were performing. Those that thought that they had a very small or no leak had exactly the same leak as those who thought that they had a moderate leak. So the, the sensitivity to what people were doing was not present. Only those who thought they had a large leak were actually correct. It turns out when we compared these, uh, these holes that the two-point po two top hold in the hands of, of people who were experienced and had practised gave the lowest leak. So it was the most effective way to hold this particular mask. This is a laodal, a laodal mask. Um, so the two-point top hold was the uh, best way to deliver mask ventilation. The best way to apply the mask was to roll it, roll it on from the chin upwards over the, over the face. And it turns out that we could teach our junior staff um, this, this technique and it improved their performance, it reduced their leak. Just after telling them in words what to do, the leak came down a little bit. By showing them what to do, it came down some more. So from above 60% down to 40%, um, with a demonstration we could get people uh, just in one session to reduce their leak and to become more effective resuscitators. And the reassuring thing about this was that when we followed up people after the teaching session, they maintained their skill level. So good technique can be taught and it can be retained. Okay, so that's mask technique. The other thing that we do a lot of in the delivery room is, um, is adjust oxygen. And I, I'm, we've, we've talked briefly this morning about the evidence of uh, high versus low oxygen. I, I think the evidence, particularly in term babies, favours low rather than high initial oxygen. <coughs> and our best guess at the moment is that we should be titrating the inspired oxygen to match the saturation of the normal term infant. And we've talked about this, uh, the best way to apply the sensor, um, turn it on, Put the, put the sensor on, connect it to the, the cable and then you'll get data within 50 to 60 seconds. That applies both for the Massimo and for the Nelcor pulse oximeter. Here are the, the curves again. People have applied different logic to these curves. This is the American Heart Association uh, response to the curves. These are their target ranges. Very narrow ranges at one minute. They would like the saturations to, between, to be between 60 and 65. 65 to 70, 70 to 75. I think, uh, in my humble opinion, this is, this is pretty unrealistic. Other countries uh, have adopted slightly wider, um, wider uh, intervals around a, uh, around a target. Um, these are the Australian guidelines here going up. We're sort of targeting around the 50th centile or a little bit lower. The Europeans are going up along the 25th centile. I think Anton made the point that 
we don't have firm evidence to guide us here. We've got uh, a rough idea of what we uh, of what we should be doing. Um, I just show you this because we need a protocol. Even in the absence of perfect evidence, we need to go down to the delivery room and adjust the oxygen according to the best evidence we have. And so this this is our take on the evidence. So for babies above 32 weeks, we will start in air. For babies less than 32 weeks, we will start in 30% oxygen for the reason Anton said this morning. Those, those, those premature babies inevitably uh, go into oxygen within the first few uh, minutes of life. So we use the, the curves and we make uh, stepwise increments. And we, we found, and we've done some bench top uh, work that supports this, that rather than trying tiny little moves and very frequently, um, the best way to, to change oxygen is in fairly large increments but fairly infrequently. So if the baby is saturating low, we will go up to 50% oxygen at three minutes, 75% at four minutes and up to 100% at five minutes or whenever we need to give external cardiac compressions. N not great evidence to support that but just our, um, our response to the available evidence. So we, we uh, make our assessments uh, for, the, for the use of oxygen at three, four, five and ten minutes. So at, at three minutes, um, at three minutes if we're less than 70, we would start oxygen at four minutes, 75 percent. At five minutes, 80 percent is when we would start extra oxygen. And uh, we go up in the uh, in the way I've uh, I've suggested 50, 75, 100 percent. If the if the oxygen uh, saturation is above the range, so above 90 percent, then we will come back come down in the inverse way every minute: 75, 50, 30, 21 percent. So again, I stress this is uh, this is just our interpretation of the evidence. Okay, so that's oxygen. Um, Peep, you've already heard about um, Anton has shown you some um, some of the the videos this is to acknowledge the team that, that generated them this is Stuart Hooper um, a, a colleague in in Melbourne uh, a physiologist who uh, has taken this technique and run with it these are very sophisticated and powerful um, x-rays but give us give us really great uh, thanks we'd go right down with the lights Right, right down. Okay. So th these are slightly different videos, but you, you can see this, that what's going on here is this is a, a rabbit being resuscitated without PEEP. At the end of expiration, fluid refills even the large airways. Okay, so it's very difficult for gas to, to penetrate all the, all the way down the uh, respiratory tree and we're getting very slow filling of the, uh, of the alveoli, taking quite a long time. That's without PEEP. So this time with PEEP, and we see the airways staying open throughout the respiratory cycle, gas getting through to the distal airways and then out into the alveoli, and much more quickly, um, effective ventilation of the of the distal alveoli being achieved. So very um, strong animal evidence for the use of PEEP. This is in a preterm animal model. And just to restate this is this is what Ilcor says about PEEP likely to be beneficial so it's a cautious seal of approval for PEEP uh, by this group during initial st stabilisation of apneic preterm infants should be used if suitable equipment is available. This is what is being said in 2010, no evidence to support or refute the value of PEEP in term infants. Um, there is now good animal evidence at least, similar films in, in term infants uh, that support the use of PEEP and I'm, I'm sure that the next generation of ILCOR guidelines will firmly come down in favour of PEEP uh, for all babies. Okay, so th those are the things I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident of. These are the things I've said are treatments that are on the horizon. Sustained inflations, uh, we've got a, a movie of sustained inflation so we'll have the lights down again. The same animal model. 
the rabbit. This is a, uh, I think it's about a 20 cent second sustained inflation. These, uh, these guys use very high pressures. They're up, up uh, 40 to 50 centimetres of water. Go down a little bit more. A little bit more. Okay, so this is a, the sustained inflation, really filling up the lungs. And then tidal, vo tidal respiration starts. So seemingly a very effective way of, of uh, establishing an FRC, clearing the lung fluid and uh, getting the um, ventil effective ventilation going. There's some interesting uh, data um, coming out of our animal lab uh, as well. This is a preterm lamb model um, around the 28-week gestation equivalent. As I said, these, uh, these physiologists, they give serious sustained inflations. This is a 40 centimetre uh, of water pressure for a minute. So not the, not the three seconds or five seconds that we were talking about this morning, but for a minute, or up to 20 mils per kilo. So the, the comparison group was a, just a, a standard resuscitation. During this experiment, the animals were changed from 21 to 100% oxygen at 10 minutes uh, of age. And this is what happened to their, to their lungs. So the no sustained inflation animals in the dark circles, uh, their compliance uh, gets better over time, but nowhere near to the same extent. The compliance of, of the animals that got the sustained inflation here at birth was much greater and stayed greater for the first half an hour of life. So uh, evidence that uh, the sustained inflation was making it easier for these animals to be ventilated. And not surprisingly, their oxygen saturations in the sustained uh, group went up uh, more rapidly. The, um, when they were changed to 100% at 10 minutes, the, uh, the no sustained inflation group caught up. The big worry with the sustained inflation, or one of the worries about sustained inflation, was what this would do to venous return. If we were over distending the lungs, perhaps we would interfere with uh, the blood supply returning to the heart. But no evidence of that. The pulmonary arterial blood flow was actually better in the sustained inflation group. So opening the lungs, uh, improving um, pulmonary perfusion um, and better pulmonary blood flow. Carotid blood flow is sort of the inverse of oxygenation. So less requirement for um, carotid blood flow in those animals that were well oxygenated in sustained inflation group, uh, higher blood flow in the control group. And a slightly interesting um, finding that when, they, when the animals were changed to 100% oxygen at 10 minutes, oxygenation of the brain stayed very stable in the sustained inflation group, but shot up very high in the control group. So that might have some practical implications. So this is a lamb model. This is not a human baby. But it's, it shows a promising therapy, fa facilitates lung aeration, improves lung compliance, better oxygenation, doesn't seem to interfere with pulmonary arterial blood flow and seems to stabilise oxygen supply to the, to the lungs, to the, uh, to the brain, I'm sorry. And we've, we've talked about this uh, this morning. The ILCOR group, when re reviewing the evidence of the three randomised trials that Anton uh, talked about this morning, said it would not endorse sustained inflations uh, at this time. So uh, it's, it's still um, something it, that, in my mind, is, is not yet ready for wide application. So we do need the, the big... Uh, pure randomised trials to answer this question and uh, they have been designed and hopefully uh, are about to be funded and start. But we have to make decisions. Is it for all babies, term babies, preterm babies? What about the baby who's breathing a little bit? Perhaps uh, this one-size-fits-all uh, issue that Anton talked about this morning is going to be a problem for these, for these babies. How much pressure? How long should we uh, use? And then what outcomes should we... Um, should we evaluate in these randomised trials? So interesting uh, concept, seems like uh, sound physiology underpinning it, but 
not yet ready, I think, for widespread use. Okay, so uh, talking a little bit more about pressure and volume, and I showed you the. Uh, I'll just this this is what our our equipment looks like. We've got a, a a flow meter here. This is a hot wire anemometer. It comes between the T piece and the face mask or the endotracheal tube. It's hooked up to the monitor here, which then displays uh, its output on a computer screen. And so what we're getting, the variables that we're getting in real time are displays of pressure, flow, this is flow going towards the infant above the line, and then flow coming back away from the infant below the line. The uh, respiratory function monitor integrates the area under the, the curve here and gives a inspiratory tidal volume and then an expiratory tidal volume. And we think these these uh, these numbers and this these displays can be quite useful. We can use them to diagnose problems like leak and also obstruction. We can make sure that we're delivering an effective tidal volume, not too big, not too small, and we can help uh, use it to identify tube position. So I'm going to show you some some tracings of of uh, how we've used this uh, technology. So. If you were looking at a uh, at the manometer, you would see the manometer is reaching 30, and this baby's on peep, so 30 on five, um, everything's fine. Gas flow, we're seeing flow going towards the baby, flow coming back from the baby, going in, coming back, volume going in, volume coming back. This is good bag and mask ventilation, effective bag and mask ventilation good tidal volumes, safe tidal volumes being delivered. That's wonderful when it happens. More often we see tracings that look like this. Again, we're getting the attainment of, of pressures. We're getting seeing the pressure manometer reach 30, go down to 5, nothing wrong there. F flow going in, flow coming back, and you can see that there's less flow below the line than above the line. Tidal volume going in, some tidal volume coming back, machine resets. And so this baby is getting a substantial leak around the face mask. So although we're putting a lot of tidal volume in, only a little is coming back. So most of that tidal volume is leaking out around the mask and not effectively ventilating the baby. So this is an example of where uh, the operator was aware of, of the problem. They could see the display. They could see they're getting a 100% leak, no flow down below the line. They take the mask off, they put it back on. Pressure's uh, being recorded throughout, but now they're getting flow below the line, so flow coming back from the baby and tidal volumes going in and out. So an example where this information helps people to correct the problem and to effectively ventilate the baby. This is the other common problem we see, and, and that's airway obstruction. So again, if you were looking at the manometer, the pressure wave is, is terrific. 30 on 5 again, so if you were looking at the manometer, no problems. This baby is achieving the pressures that you want, but no gas flow, no volume going in or out of the baby. So that could be from a number of reasons. The mask might be being pressed too tightly on the baby's face, so no gas is getting through, or the neck may be hyperexpanded or hyperflexed. One way or another, this baby is not being effectively ventilated. We looked uh, at all our recordings um, and we found that significant reduction, 75% reduction, is, is occurring in about one in four resuscitations. Face mask leak, if we said that more than 75% is, is clinically important, this is happening in about 50% of resuscitations. So many, many resuscitations, the ones that we get called to because they're not going well, are due to these problems, either the mask uh, leaking or the, the airway being obstructed. Here's another example of, of where this information might, might be uh, useful. Here we've got a baby being ventilated through an endotracheal tube. Everything's going fine. Pressures, uh, flows and volumes being, being delivered. The tube comes out, still achieving pressures, but no flow coming back. The tube has slipped out into the esophagus. 
Okay, and uh, you might not know that. You would only know that the baby is getting worse. But is it a pneumothorax? Uh, is the tube blocked? Um, no, you can say that this tube has slipped out because there's no longer gas coming back from it. We can use uh, this technology to diagnose overventilation. So here's an example of, uh, a, of a resuscitation where the operator did not know what was going on. This was being recorded blind. Uh, the operator was blind to these recordings. But what they did was start with a pressure of 30. They're actually generating very tiny tidal volumes. Increase the pressure to 42 generating good therapeutic tidal volumes, five to eight mils per kilo. Thought if a little bit more pressure is good, a bit more will be even better. And they overshot and were gen generating 14 mils per kilo, so getting up into a range that might be damaging to the lungs. Here's an example of uh, a resuscitation where the operator was aware of the, uh, of the recording. So started off with low tidal volumes, three mils per kilo, put the pressure up to 40 centimetres of water, generating 10 mils per kilo, so overshot, too much tidal volume. Weaned the pressure back down and the tidal volume comes back down into a normal, safe, effective range. And just by the by, you'll, you'll notice that uh, the pressure at the end of this little um, sequence is lower than the start but the tidal volume is higher. So the act of expanding the lungs, opening up the lungs, means that uh, at the end of this exercise, the baby is needing less pressure to generate a better tidal volume. If you're giving surfactant in the delivery room, this can, uh, the respiratory function monitor can give you useful information. It will tell you that very frequently the surfactant will completely obstruct the endotracheal tube and you'll get no tidal volume delivery. Here the operators increase the pressure to 25 centimetres of water. Starts to get a little bit of flow. The volumes come up, up to a therapeutic range, 4.7 mils per kilo. All of a sudden the baby takes a very big breath, clears the, clears the surfactant and suddenly with the same pressure we're now overventilating up to 11 mils per kilo. So if we're aware of this information, we can titrate the amount of pressure we're using uh, down to the baby's requirements. Does it matter? These, these are all nice theoretical demonstrations, but does it do any good in the real world? Well, this, this is relatively new technology. So what we wanted to do was just test it in a, in a pilot study, and that's, that's what we did. Um, we, look, we were looking at preterm babies, so babies less than 32 weeks. But the clinicians decided that the baby needed to have some mask ventilation. And they were randomised to have the uh, respiratory function monitor visible so they could see the pressure flow and tidal volume waves or have that um, mask, have that display covered. It's a fairly small trial. There's only 50-odd uh, babies in the, in the trial. What we were looking to do was to show that there would be a decrease in mask leak. If you could see the, uh, see the display, you'd be able to adjust the mask position, reduce the, the mask leak by 15%. So the first thing we found when we, uh, we looked at our results, that if, if you could see the, the, the uh, respiratory function monitor, you're more likely to make a change in mask position. So three quarters of the babies in the visible group uh, change position of the mask through the um, through the resuscitation. So operators were looking at the uh, at the display and changing things accordingly. Also twiddling the uh, peak inspiratory pressure dial. So uh, more often were they doing that in the displayed group than the vi invisible group. And yes, it did reduce leak from fifty four percent down to thirty seven percent in the visible group. This is a small study and I don't want to uh, overestimate this, it's not a blinded study, but there was a reduction in the rate of intubation in the delivery room from 57% to 21% where people were aware of what they were giving. This was perhaps the most important result. So th these, this, these are the tidal volumes. 
The safe tidal volumes, we think somewhere between four mils per kilo and eight mils per kilo. This is the RFM visible group where the operators could see the monitor. Um, and you can see that 75% of the, the breaths were in that safe range. Where the, where the uh, monitor was masked, very similar median uh, tidal volume, but an increase at the upper range of tidal volume. So more um, tidal volumes in the unsafe range above eight mils per kilo, and that was statistically significant. That difference in intubation rate in the delivery room decreased in the first 24 hours to the point where it was not uh, quite statistically significant and no other differences in the uh, other important neonatal outcomes. So this was a, a, an interesting first experience of, of using this technology in the delivery room. It's not easy to apply. It's uh, not readily available at present. Uh, it's quite expensive technology at the moment. People need to be trained to look at the waves and interpret the waves, react to the waves. And as we're talking about with pulse oximetry, it's important to keep your eye on the baby, not just to watch the, the squiggles on the screen. So it, it's potentially dis distracting. So there are some important limitations to this technology. But I, I think it's it's got... Uh, a lot of um, potential usefulness. I, I really like to have it in the delivery room if I'm going to a difficult delivery, a diaphragmatic hernia or a baby whose membranes have been ruptured for five or six weeks and I'm not quite sure what the uh, compliance of the lungs is going to be. If I've got that extra piece of information of the tidal volumes I'm delivering, I feel much safer. That's probably a way away before it's routinely used in the delivery room, but I think what it's helped us uh, understand is why sometimes particularly mask resuscitation doesn't go well and it doesn't go well in many cases, particularly with inexperienced operators. They've got a big leak or they've got an obstruction, it doesn't work. This explains, helps explain why. I think the most immediate usefulness of, of this technology is, is in training, training people in, in mask technique uh, Having said that, um, looking at the chest, looking at a manometer, uh, they're imperfect ways of ga gauging, um, gauging ventilation. To use this technology to help people acquire the, the skills to apply a mask correctly, I think is a potential, potentially very useful uh, way of applying this technology. Okay, so th this is what I think are the take home message messages. First to decide whether the baby needs resuscitation, aggressive resuscitation, a grey, pale, bradycardic baby, or it just needs some gentle help in making that transition, stabilisation. If the baby does need resuscitation, it's all about ventilation. Mask ventilation is not as easy as we were taught. There are lots of pitfalls. It can be done well. We can teach people to do it well. If it's not going well, if the resuscitation is not going well, then consider, have you got a problem with um, application of the mask? Is it leaking? Uh, are you leaking gas from around the mask? Or is your airway becoming obstructed? Oxygen usage, this is my take, and I, I think it's, uh, it's very similar to um, Anton's. I think we should be titrating um, our oxygen use so that we're achieving saturations that we see in normal term babies. I personally think rather than starting high and coming down, we're better off starting low and going up. If we regard oxygen as a, as a drug, we should be using the lowest dose that we need to, uh, that we can to achieve what we want to do. So I like the idea of starting low and increasing. I think PEEP, uh, the evidence on PEEP is now sufficient that we use it in routinely in term babies and I'm very happy to use it in term term babies as well during resuscitation. I put sustained inflations in the what's this space column. More, more trials to come out, better trials, bigger trials. I think it's very promising but uh, perhaps not for everyone just yet. And respiratory function monitoring, again, a, a very promising way of fine-tuning ventilation uh, in the delivery room for babies at risk and even more promising as an educational tool. So I hope uh, that's useful to you. I thank you for your attention and I'd uh, love to answer questions. Thanks very much.
Well, uh, perhaps it's it's jaw, it's it's forcing the jaw back. Um, I think jaw position. I, I didn't mention that is, is is quite important. So supporting the supporting the jaw. I think it's possible to press the mask so tightly against the the face that it's very difficult to squeeze air past. Yeah. And sometimes people get so anxious that they're they're trying to avoid a leak that they're pushing really hard. And where people have measured force. Uh, during um, resuscitation, sometimes they found extraordinary pressures being applied to the to the face. Yeah. Would you like to comment on the use of sustained inflation bandwidths that you require? Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's a, a very reasonable question, particularly you know having made the point that it's possible to uh, to cause big damage with a, a, a few breaths that are too big. What we need to distinguish uh, is between a gas-filled lung and a fluid-filled lung. I think the role of a sustained inflation is probably to deal with a fluid-filled lung. So that long, slow pressure is going to be more effective at driving the, the fluid back. And if that's what we're treating, then the risk of pneumothorax is quite low. I think the, the randomised trials, imperfect as they were, did not raise pneumothorax as an issue, but it's certainly a very logical question and that's one reason why I think we need more evidence before we start widely applying it. it uh, Anton raised, raised the issue of one size fits all. You know, should we be using 20 centimetres for 15 seconds? Well, it probably, matter, it probably depends on how mature the baby is, whether the baby's taken a small gasp and partially aerated the lungs, or whether we're starting with a very fluid-filled surfactant-deficient lungs. It would make more sense um, that a baby who's already partially uh, aerated the lungs and was perhaps uh, steroid-loaded, that baby might be at risk of pneumothorax with a long, a long, slow inflation. Yeah. Yeah, again, that's another reason to go cautiously with it, and I, I'm certainly that's that's what I my uh, conclusion is. It's not not ready for widespread application until uh, we've we've uh, looked at near infrared spectroscopy of, of cerebral circulation. I think would be one way of, of uh, answering that that very sensible sen sensible concern. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's sort of a vicious circle. They 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 won't um, make it until there's a lot of evidence around. We can't get a lot of evidence until they make it. There have been a number of of companies, including Drager and Fisher and Paykel, who have we've got to various stages of negotiation, but they've always fallen at the final hurdle. Um, we're going through this again with another company who are, are promising that they it's it's about to happen. I'm sure it will happen sometime because it, it, it makes sense and as we become more dependent on these waveforms in the in the intensive care unit, the application in the delivery room is uh, is going to naturally follow. But I think they're looking for more evidence from trials like this that, that it's going to work and then that people will buy them before they uh, make large-scale large, large scale investments. The technology is not particularly revolutionary. It's in all our all our ventilators already. So uh, it, it can be done and it can probably be done quite cheaply once it's uh, developed for a um, for a larger market. But uh, I, I think slowly but surely this article was only published last year so it, it's it's still we're still getting there. Yeah, strategy when lung hypoplasia is expected. That's that's a good question, and this is this is as I said, this is a, an example where I really like to have that information um, on on lung volumes when I'm going to a resuscitation. So I'd be aiming at the the lower end of the tidal volume range and see if I could 
get this baby going with four mils or five mils per kilo rather than uh, needing needing really high high pressures and high volumes to to get this baby going. So a, a conservative approach to to, to try and uh, get away with the least possible tidal volumes that I could in in a in a baby with pulmonary hypoplasia and, and minimise the risk of pneumothorax, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much more um, conservative. I accept a pH down to seven point two, uh, irrespective of what the CO two was. I'd be happy for the CO two to to drift up into the sixties uh, for a baby like that. Um, not worry so much about oxygenation. Um, often for those babies, oxygenation isn't such a big problem, but uh, being more relaxed about tolerating. Um, saturations maybe maybe down into the high 80s, uh, CO2s into the into the mid to high 60s, pHs down to 7.2. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what would happen if uh, we uh, send him equipment and uh, place a conventional ventilator yep. and connect to the face mask? Yeah, that, that yep. could, could be done. Could be done. Yeah, if you've got the money to to put a a, um, a ventilator everywhere where a baby's going to deliver, that that would that would be fine. But it's a fairly expensive solution to the to the problem. Yeah. And you use it? You use it in that way? No, I, I wonder uh, what's the problem to try this uh, strategy and bring the uh, conventional respirator ventilator to the delivery. Yeah, it it could be done. It it's it's bulky, but uh, not impossible. Andreas, you use it? Yeah. So use the single, single prong. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we've exhausted all the questions. Thanks very much. Good questions.